My father first flew in 1936. Uh, I can tell stories about that. He uh, wound up with a motorcycle growing up because his father said if man had been meant to fly, man would have had wings. And as soon as he got out on his own, he learned how to fly. Uh, I grew up, was born in 53. Daddy's had a beach bonanza since 1951. And just, I, I grew up thinking everybody had an airplane in the family. Uh, thought about flying in the military, had glasses. Whoops, okay, so, you know, did college for other stuff. My background is electronics, avionics, and so if there's a radio trouble, I'll work on that. If a landing light doesn't work, I'll work on that. Anything like that, and I, yeah, I'm not afraid to turn a wrench and get oily either, just whatever we need done on it. Everybody here has a real wide range of skills. This was parked about two hangers over from the avionics shop where I was working. It was just sitting there. Didn't know what it was. You know, it, we drove by it every day, etc. Finally, one day, these guys were out working on it. Walked over and says, "What is this thing?" And you know, I, I had no clue. And so they started talking about it. About a month later, I made the mistake of going up and asking, "Do y'all ever need any help with this?" And uh, that was about five years ago, and I've been pretty busy with it ever since. This is a World War II design. It was actually a mid-war design. You had the B-17, B-25, B-24 when the war started. They were at a disadvantage because of speed. You put the 170 mile an hour B-17 against 300 mile an hour German fighters, whoops, okay. There was a attack bird, which was basically a overgrown gunship called an A-20 Havoc. The A-20 Havoc, we built a lot of those. We gave some to the Brits, some to the Russians. Uh, if you watch D-Day invasion films, you'll see the A-20 Havocs with the invasion stripes on them. It looks basically the same outline as this airplane. This is one of those on a lot of steroids. They needed to follow on to that, so they put basically double the number of cylinders here, a lot more horsepower, stretched it out, more fuel, higher speed wing, expanded the fuselage to be able to carry bombs in addition to just crew members, added more guns to it, just made it more of everything. Douglas wanted to sell a whole lot of these, so they built even a torpedo carrying capability into this airplane. Speed was the key to it. This thing is basically two P-47 or Corsair fighter engines. This is a laminar flow wing like a P-51. It's built to get up and go. You guys will probably shoot some head-on shots of this and you'll see the frontal area on it. It's really not very big. That equates to low drag and high speed. There's a red line on this airframe at 424 miles an hour if the bomb bay doors are open. It'll go faster than that if they're closed. A lot of our information that we have on this comes from veterans who actually flew them. I've talked to three people on the ramp here at Oshkosh who are in the airplanes and claim to have hit 500 in dives in these things. It's built to go fast. Freedom through innovation. It's what led us to develop Cirrus Flying 2.0, the framework for a bold new take on private aviation. And as a result, the gap between the aircraft we produce and those of our competitors continues to widen. Cirrus knows where the personal aircraft industry is headed. We're already there. A lot of people have no, you know, just like I was, they don't have a clue about it, what it is, you know. We are mistaken quite often for a B-25. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, little later design than that, little slicker bird. Uh, different gun layout, uh, different crewing, you know, entirely different from that. But uh, a lot of people don't realize how fast it really is. They don't realize the service life of this. These things flew as B-26s in Korea, dropped the first American bomb, the last American bomb in Korea, flew all the way up into Vietnam. By that time, the airframes were getting quite tired. They sent them to California to on mark. They rebuilt them, uh, heavier spars, heavier tires supercharged the engines harder for more horsepower, put wingtip tanks on them for more range, and flew them up against the Ho Chi Minh Trail. In World War II, this was an ideal truck and train killer. In Vietnam, this was an ideal truck convoy killer. Of course, after it came out of military service, uh, every gun, everything's taken out of it. Uh, originally, this thing was equipped with 650 caliber Browning machine guns in the nose. Now, I have to reference that with this bird, because it changed through the production run. This is the oldest flying serial number. 
This bird, when it left, had the 650s in the nose. There were 450s under the wing. They were fed 50 caliber belts through the wing. So there were 14 forward mounted guns at the pilot's disposal. He had a gun sight right in front of him in the dash that he looked at there. There were two turrets on the back end, one on the top and one on the bottom. Everybody thinks the B-17 turrets with some guy just curled up inside the turret, okay? These things were remote control. There wasn't anybody in them. We basically had a submarine chamber in the back of this. There was a periscope that went out the top and went out the bottom of the airplane, had prisms on it. There's a guy sitting there with a periscope looking through that, and that's how he sighted the rear guns. It'd carry 4,000 pounds of bombs. Douglas designed this to sell as many as they could, so they made it versatile. Our service manuals talk about torpedo releases. There were chemical warfare tanks in these, just whatever they needed. Now, I'm talking about World War II vintage right now. When it got up into Vietnam, they put hard points under the wings, it'd shoot rockets, it'd do all kinds of stuff there. Uh, it's had an interesting, versatile life. The beauty of the Release 9 system architecture is that you have two fully redundant integrated flight displays. Each has access to all the systems and data. Providing full redundancy and eliminating traditional reversionary modes, Release 9 allows either display to be configured as the PFD. Now your failure modes are much more manageable because you can continue to fly with the same familiar display symbology without the need to relearn composite modes you don't typically fly with. Avidyne's Integra Release 9 is truly the next generation in fully integrated flight deck technology. You know, I have to say I'm one of the luckiest people on earth. I'm affiliated with a real neat bunch of caring people here. They like the Warbird. Let's keep it in the air. They put a lot of money and time out of their own pockets in it. And we occasionally get to show it off like this. I'm here at Oshkosh. I'm sitting on top of World War II Warbird. I'm looking around this ramp. There's airplanes every direction all the way around here. I got the best view in the house of the air show. I've got tons of nice people coming by wanting to ask about the airplane. There's a cafe over here I can sit at, eat my bacon and eggs in the morning and look out on fighters sitting there. I wake up to the morning of fighter sounds. You don't get any better than that. And here I am at Oshkosh getting to play with this thing on the bird that I like and I get to fly in it, yes. The airframe will hold up for a long time. Uh, we fly it maybe 35, 40 hours maximum a year. If we're down for maintenance through that, it's even less hours that we are putting on the airframe. I, it's going to be around for a long time in the future. There are issues in coming up. Okay, we burn low lead 100 fuel. We burn a lot of it, okay? We flight plan 200 gallons the first hour, 150 gallons an hour every hour after that. You know, I mean, these are thirsty pigs, okay? so. Someday we're going to run out of literally low lead 100. What are we going to do then? Nobody has certified any other fuel for these engines yet. This is a really nice gig. I can't say enough about that. Here you get to fly the thing and show it off. You know, we don't put many hours on it. We put our hearts into it quite often just to continue to, you know, take it to air shows and show it off for the public. You can see something in a textbook. It's not just, okay, it's there. It's a fact. It doesn't hit you in the heart the same as when you can be out here and I can show somebody, I can bring them up the ladder, put them in the seat, say, you're now sitting in the cockpit of a World War II bomber that actually flew in World War II. Anybody that's heard me tour through this has heard that phrase. Getting people through it, you know, that's probably the best part because you may get somebody that's never been around an airport before, you may get somebody that's flown these before. But it's history, it's live history, and we get to share it. And we're around an airport doing it, and just like today, pretty sun, other airplanes in the background, how do you beat that? And hopefully, general aviation will stay going like this for years and years and years to come. We'll see what happens.